Look at this crazy waterfall view. Now in this video, we're going to be talking about the origin of cells, the subtopic 1.5. So let's just get into it. So we learned before, okay, in this chapter that there's something called the cell theory and it has three key points. One, all living organisms are made of one or more cell, right? Like us, we're made up of billions of cells. Two, cells are the smallest unit of life. Yes, that's true. It's the smallest living thing. And three, all cells come from pre-existing cells. In this video, we got to focus on this one. We got to care a little bit extra about this one. So let's quickly circle this, okay? This last one, all cells come from pre-existing cells. How can we prove this? How did scientists prove this to be true? So there's a guy called Louis Pasteur, okay? And he is the one who actually proved this to be true, okay? And today, we're gonna find out how he did this, okay? Louis Pasteur is gonna be Mr. Beast, okay, today, okay? Because mm, we don't really care about how he looks like, okay? He's, he, he exists a long time ago, there's no real good pictures, they're all black and whites and whatnot. So let's use Mr. Beast. He is gonna be our Louis Pasteur. And how did he prove that all cells come from pre-existing cells? So what he did was simple. He took, he went into his lab, okay? And we ha he had this setup, okay, this setup. So this flask, right? And he put in there some chicken soup, okay? Some chicken broth, okay? He boiled it. He boiled it in order to make sure, so this is the fire. He boiled this to make sure that all the cells in there are dead, okay? He made sure it is sterile. There's no nothing in there, no living cells, nothing. And then he waited. He waited, he gave it some time, and then, and then tried to see what happened. And he noticed nothing happened, okay? Nothing grew. Over time, there was no cells that grew, nothing happened. The mixture stayed exactly the same, okay? Then, what he did is he kind of tried to repeat his experiment, but he changed one thing in the process. So, again, he started off boiling his uh, chicken broth, and then he waited, okay? He waited some time, and then what he did instead is he broke off he broke off this top piece. This allowed um, this, okay, basically, this allowed the outside environment to be to be able to get in contact with the with this mixture. Okay. So basically air was able to go in. And we know inside air we have a lot of cells, right? We have bacteria and all of these kinds of cells, right? This means they were able to go in here. And then he waited. So now he left the experiment and, and waited to see what will happen. And after time, he noticed some stuff grew, some, some um, mold started growing, some things started growing in there. So basically, this proves to us that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Because in this experiment, he killed all the cells and he closed off the environment. No air was able to get in and nothing grew, okay? Because you can't, a cell can't magically appear out of nowhere. It needs to come from a pre-existing cell. And then came this experiment and he managed to open it, allowing cells to come in. And because cells were allowed to come in, the cells were able to duplicate because cells come from pre-existing cells, right? And so it able to grow. And basically that's how he proved this one aspect of cell theory. Okay, real simple, right? Okay, now we have to move on to the next part. So we know we are made up of billions of cells, right? Now, um, we are a multicellular organism, so we are made up of many of them, billions. But cells can also exist by themselves, like in the form of bacteria. Bacteria are single-celled organisms, right? Now, how did these cells come into existence? How did the first cell ever appear? Okay, we cannot know exactly how it appeared because we're not at that stage in our knowledge yet, like scientists. But we do know that some things must have existed in order for cells to form, okay? And we and these things include organic molecules. So organic molecules, um, you'll learn later in IV biology, it's basically um, big molecules that include proteins, fats, uh, nucleic acids, so DNA, and then uh, carbohydrates. These are organic molecules. So because cells are made up of uh, organic molecules, it means that before a cell could have existed, these organic molecules must have existed, okay? It must have been in the environment before cells came along, okay? Now, we know that organic molecules um, aren't simple, right? We, we have many different types of proteins, small proteins, big proteins. We have big carbohydrates, small carbohydrates, long chains of DNA, short chains of DNA. We have many different sizes. So because we know we have many different sizes, we must know that there must have been a way that um, 
the environment was able to make these big organic molecules from small ones. There must have been a way that all these smaller organic molecules were able to be assembled into these bigger pieces to make different shapes and different sizes of organic molecules to allow the diversity and the unique structure of the cell, okay? So that's another thing we needed to know. And then um, there must, we know that our cells or bacteria can replicate, turn from one into two. So based on this knowledge, there must have been a, some molecules that existed um, before cells came along that was able to replicate that was able to go from being one into being two because that concept would be used in cells in order to allow them to be able to replicate, right? So there must have been molecules like DNA that was able to du duplicate, okay? Uh, lastly, membranes must have been formed. We know all cells are surrounded by a membrane to allow all of these organelles to be safe and sound and to have the appropriate environment to survive. Now. That means that before cells existed, there must have been like one huge membrane where all these things were going on, all of these three things, until eventually the membrane got quite small and formed a cell. It must have been something along these lines. A membrane must have been formed to enclose all of these molecules, all of these things I'm talking about for a cell to be able to form, right? So again, it's good to understand and know what I'm talking about here, but it's not that important for the IB. They're not going to really emphasize on this. Just understand what I was just talking about and make sure you can say one or two things about it, but it's not that crucial, okay? More, you should understand what this concept was about, okay? Because that is testable. And remember this guy's name. It's not Mr. Beast. It's Louis Pasteur. Okay. Now... So I was just talking about very simple cells, okay? I was not necessarily referring to our complicated cells. Our cells are very, very complicated. This concept could have applied to the most basic cell, a very, very simple cell that barely has anything inside, barely has any organelles. Now, how did these complicated cells start forming? Because we know these cells have a lot of organelles. So there's a theory that these complicated cells were formed by a process called endosymbiotic theory. So let me explain endosymbiotic okay I'll explain what this word means but for now we know symbiotic means to work together some um, symbiosis right when two things work together so let me you'll, you'll see how this makes sense but basically it is the theory is that there was a very large simple cell it had some DNA it didn't really have organelles no organelles and it was just able to survive and this large cell encountered a smaller cell a smaller prokaryotic cell like a bacteria okay, like a bacteria, and it was basically able to engulf, to eat this, this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, what do you call it, bacteria, this bacteria, okay, through endocytosis, so that's where endo comes from, through endocytosis, it was able to bring it inside, endo means inside, right, so it was bringing this, pro, uh, this prokaryote inside, this big cell ate this smaller cell, and then the smaller cell eventually came into the into the bigger cell completely okay so bear in mind this cell was able to live by itself before right it was in the environment freely living and now it was just eaten by this predator okay and now it's inside this big cell and after a while we know this cell was able to replicate outside of this this big cell because it was able to live and survive like normal so after a while this thing started replicating and started building up inside this big cell eventually becoming a part of this cell, okay? Eventually became a part of the cell. After a long time, these now depend on each other. They started getting used to each other and now actually need each other to survive. So what I just explained here is how, is how um, these organelles started to come together, how these complicated cells were formed. Because mitochondria, so this right here, is exactly the theory of how my my mitochondria started forming inside eukaryotic cells because we are eukaryotic right so the endosymbiotic theory describes how eukaryotic cells were formed so this is exactly how they think the mitochondria started coming into our eukaryotic cells and what's their evidence so this is just a story right so a story is just a story there needs to be evidence so the evidence is that um Oh yeah, so this, this what I described here could have been mitochondria or a chloroplast, okay? Once free living by itself and now a part of our, our eukaryotic cells. So the evidence for this whole process is that um, mitochondria and chloroplasts, so these organelles right here, remember chloroplasts is in a plant cell, but mitochondria is in both. So the theory is that 
um, the evidence is that mitochondria and chloroplasts have ribosomes that are different from the rest of the cell. Okay, they have their own separate ribosomes, and this suggests that this this kind of supports that once upon a time these organelles were actually free living, like this little prokaryote. Okay, because they have different ribosomes. Secondly, they have their own types of DNA. They have their own DNA separate from the nucleus. Okay, so if we look at these mitochondria, we can find DNA that is that is that is only located here and it's separate from the nucleus. So this also suggests that they were able to live by themselves in the long ago because they need DNA to replicate and survive and all these kinds of things. So that's two evidences already. The third evidence is that basically these organelles have a double membrane, a double membrane. So what I mean by double membrane is that they have their own membrane plus this membrane, plus this membrane that was formed when it was taken up by the cell. Okay, so all the other organelles don't have this double membrane, okay, um, some of the other organelles, but this, these do, and this double organelle idea suggests that they were taken up by endocytosis, um, by, some, by this big cell, because they have their own membrane plus this membrane that was formed to take them in, okay, they have their own envelope, okay, and the last one is they can replicate by themselves, so we know that once they live by themselves, so they're able to replicate, of course, and survive by themselves, and not only can they replicate outside by themselves, but they actually replicate inside our cells. So we have mitochondria, and when um, during the growth of the cell, these mitochondria can duplicate and make more and more. So the fact that they can make more and more by themselves suggests also that they were free living ones because they can replicate independently of the cell. Okay, they don't only replicate when the cell replicates; they repl replicate whenever they want to. So all of these four things are evidences that. Once upon a time, our mitochondria um, uh, was once free living, and that eukaryotic cells were formed by this endosymbiotic theory. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. This concept is quite important. They can easily ask some long answer questions, like five, six more questions, explaining the endosymbiotic theory and what. Um, normally, when you answer this kind of question, you should explain this process I just did here, and mention what organelles um, were taken up by this theory and maybe some evidences, one or two of these, and you'll get pretty much full marks. So this is important, endo endosymbiotic theory. Um, now, now we get to this last part, okay? So here we have, maybe you recognize this, maybe you don't, but this is Gusto's Restaurant, okay? Gusto's Restaurant. If you've watched Ratatouille, if you haven't, you gotta watch Ratatouille, okay? Go do it now, before you finish this video. But anyways, there was some criti cr critics, we know this is the critic from Ratatouille, and there were some people who didn't really believe this theory, okay? And I'm going to show you what those pe why those people didn't believe this theory, why those scientists didn't believe this theory, and why they um, may be wrong, why, why there is evidence that they could be wrong. Let me show you. So these critics say one of two things. Okay, one thing they say is, even if the prokaryotic cells, cells were engulfed by larger cells, like I just explained, there is no certainty that, would, that they would be passed on to both daughter cells when the larger cell divides because there is no special mechanism to ensure this. So this sentence is basically saying that they don't believe this is true because when, when these cells divide, um, how do they know that the daughter cells will have these organelles? How do they know? Well, the thing is, we know that when these cells divide, the two daughter cells will come from this cell. So it's impossible for these organelles to escape. They must end up in one of the two daughter cells. So therefore, this theory just must be wrong. Now, the second one, and, and also, we know that, um, that these mitochondria or these chloroplasts can duplicate by themselves, right? And when they duplicate a lot like this, they become so much that, it, that the ratio, that the odds of being present in the, in, the, in the future cells that divide is very high. It's very unlikely that none of the mitochondria will go to the, to the daughter cells, okay? Okay, the second critic that they have is that they believe that mitochondria, they've seen that mitochondria and chloroplasts, when you take them out of the cell, they don't survive outside of the cell. They will die, okay? And they believe that this proves this theory wrong because they believe that, okay, if you guys are saying that these were able to live by themselves at one point, then, okay, let's take them out and see if they can. And then they saw that they couldn't survive. So now they're like, nope, this is wrong. But the, but the, the, to, to counter this, this argument, um, scientists say that over time, these 
um, chloroplast that were taken in and these and these mitochondria that were taken in started getting lazy and they started um, depending on this host cell and that's why we call it symbiotic because they work together these these mitochondria started to depend on the cell and the cell this um, started to depend on the mitochondria for energy right so over time they got lazy and they started um, not needing to be so intelligent at survival because they had this cell to help them so therefore, when we take them out now, they actually do die, die. But this doesn't prove that this theory doesn't isn't true, okay? It just proves that over time, these mitochondria started changing the way they behave and started changing the way they survive, okay? So that's it. That's all that you need to know about 1.5, the origin of cells. Um, I would say overall, emphasize on endosymbiotic theory. Know what it is. Know how to explain it. Don't worry too much about this stuff, the critics. This is just me saying some stuff to you that just you need to be aware of, but it's not a big thing. This is a big thing, and I would say um, this Louis Pasteur's experiment is a big thing, okay?